Hello, everyone, and welcome for joining. I'm Greg Lindsay, Director of Research here at New Cities. Uh, Bonjour, we're here halfway through the first day. Halfway through here, sorry, hearing my interpretation come in for just a second. Um, yes, it's my pleasure now, as I mentioned at the end of our last session DIY, we're now turning to focus here on Montreal. So uh, for those of you who joined us this morning, you know that uh, I'm physically here. Many of us are spiritually here in Montreal, home of the Wellbeing Cities Award and Forum. Uh, and now it's my pleasure to introduce uh, I will introduce our moderator in just a moment here to have this special session uh, on protecting urban biodiversity. And of course, many are aware that uh, that during this time, you know, America, that the world is going through the so, sort of so-called sixth extinction, uh, massive biodiversity loss globally. But this is always, of course, portrayed as a phenomenon happening in the wilds of the world, uh, while at the same time, it's imperative to protect urban biodiversity as well. And that will be the focus of our session this afternoon here in Eastern Time. Um, with that note, it's my pleasure to introduce our moderator for the session, uh, Kobe Brand, who's the Global Director of ICLEI Cities Biodiversity Center and the Regional Director of ICLEI Africa. Please take it away. Thank you very much. Um, it's, it's a great pleasure to be here and join you in this New Cities um, online platform, which is fast becoming our new normal. And what a way for us to connect in ways that we haven't been connecting before. Greg, I want to ask you, um, are you going to introduce our speakers or are you handing over to me to do that? I'll reappear. I was going to ask you, our last session, uh, our moderator asked to introduce the speakers himself. So I was going to let, let the pleasure to you, but I'm happy to do so myself if you'd like. Right. I, th I think, Greg, in... in um, uh, in the spirit of this being a, a all-woman panel, I'm very happy to introduce our speakers um, this evening, and I'm very pleased this afternoon, evening for me, here in Africa, um, and I'm very very pleased to welcome, um, firstly, our executive secretary of the CBD, um, Elizabeth Mrema. Um, Elizabeth is um, a well-known figure in international circles, a career diplomat who's worked for many, many years in the United Nations framework, but she comes from Africa. And in fact, we're going to focus a little bit on that history as well with Elizabeth tonight or this afternoon. And then our second speaker, of course, is um, our very, very wonderful pioneering city of Montreal, um, represented tonight by Laurence Lavigne Lalonde. Laurence um, works in the uh, office of Mayor Valerie Plant and is um, one of her trusted colleagues focusing on biodiversity, nature-based solutions, um, diplomacy, and also um, part of the executive office of Mayor, Mayor Valerie Plant, who is of course also Italy's global ambassador for biodiversity, a woman we, have, we are very proud of. So even if we are a full woman panel, we are representing more women here in the spirit of um, connecting people with nature. All women panel, what an honor to focus this evening on this topic with you. So my first question, and this is going to be an informal, intimate discussion, is going to be to our Executive Secretary of the CBD, Elizabeth. Elizabeth, you come, you've, you've, you've got a illustrious, fantastic career in the international field, a career diplomat, as I said, with a fantastic law degree, background, etc. But you come from a country close to me, Tanzania, Tell us a little bit about that first experience that you had when you first realized a calling to connect you with nature and your first experiences living in Tanzania. Where did you grow up and when did you first realize that humanity is so intimately connected with nature? Thank you very much, Kobe. I don't know where to begin, but I, I was born and grew up at the slopes of mountain Kilimanjaro. For those of us who know geography very well, mountain Kilimanjaro is the highest mountain in Africa and the highest single standing free mountain in the world. And my home is exactly three kilometers from the point 
where climbers begin to climb the mountain. I grew up in that surrounding where nature was there and everything was taken. It's there indefinitely in perpetuity. And the word environment, I mean, I knew about environment virtually when I was at the university as a subject. Even when I went to university college, the cause on environment never existed. And this I'm talking uh, early 80s. So you can understand the environment we speak today when that awareness really got into a number of our societies. Nonetheless, the nature in terms of biodiversity was very rich. I mean, I, Kilimanjaro, the slopes, everywhere is just forest. The water was just flowing from the mountain to our backyard. I recall as I grew up, I mean, I'm talking now 50s, 60s, we did not have taps, water taps to home, but basically we are using the streams of water flowing from the mountain and water will go behind and then this is the place where we grow a lot of banana and just the streams are dug uh, to uh, feed uh, the water into the banana and when we want to wash, you just create a ditch, collect water, spring water, crystal clear, and we'll wash our clothes or cleaning the home. It was only drinking water where we'll go, uh, drinking and cooking where then we'll go and collect at particular places. The rest of the water was free for all. That was those years. Today, you cannot believe it, that I go home and I see women carrying baskets, searching for water at the slopes of the mountain. That clearly indicates the damage we have done. Of course, the trees, particularly the indigenous trees have all gone down. Most of the indigenous trees have disappeared because remember, as I grew up, the source of energy was firewood. So basically, any home cooking in the village was firewood. And the more firewood we used, the more trees went down. And these are the impacts. Of course, these days now, there's a lot of campaign uh, in terms of reforestation. But those trees which took 100 years to mature, in every, virtually we'll never get them. So this is where I grew up. And I, I use, because this, uh, the mountain itself, if you go to the peak, is 5,800 plus meters above sea level. Where I come from, it's about 2,800, already that high up. So anywhere you walk, you could hear streams of water flowing, even on the roadside, on both sides, permanently. January to January, the water flows. That water is no longer there unless it rains. When it is so hot, literally people have to fetch water. That, and every time I go home, I look at that environment and how the, that, that nature which I grew up, those forests, the bushes, that they are all now have become, either were built because of course population has grown, they've become farms because of population, people have to get food, food security. So those changes are there and that's in the village. My school time, most of the part, I was in Dar es Salaam, then the capital city. Of course, during those days, the urban, Green, green urban spaces, the urban parks we are talking today did not exist. And did not exist, not necessarily because we did not know, or the government did not know, but the priorities were such that what is important, people have to get food at whatever cost. So you are dealing with a poverty situation, food security. It's only in the recent years that we are talking of urban green spaces. Even equally, just last year, if I recall, uh, that you, uh, you unveiled uh, uh, the Dar es Salaam Atlas on Natural Assets, 2019. The country has been independent over 40 years. So that again tells you it's only now that we are talking of green spaces, natural world. The beach has been there, 
but again, free for all. All waste goes to the beach. All plastic goes to the beach. Now, of course, there's that pressure to clean up the beaches. Again, the awareness campaigns in the recent years have a lot to do with that. The city of Moshi, my village is called Marangu, Moshi, recently, that Moshi has been winning current wide, I mean, countrywide for being the cleanest city in the country. And virtually today, if you walk around and just throw your, uh, for smokers, you have smoke and throw a match box, it is almost 50,000 shillings on the spot. It's peanut if I put it in dollars, but for a, for, for a person in the country is a lot of money because that's a salary of somebody. So the city has been so clean, but it's because of all the pressure of the policy which was put in by the national uh, sub, sub national uh, government in the city. And this is where your role has become so important because in Moshi, it has worked well. You go to Moshi, spotless. You park in the wrong place, it is a fine. And the enforcement is mm -hmm. really, has really put pressure on individuals. So again, awareness, enforcement comes to play and awareness for people to understand why do I need a clean place? Why do I need uh, a green place? Of course, Moshi everywhere is green because of the topography of the place, but it's all taken for granted. God has created it. It is there. It will be there forever. But developments clearly we know this is not just God given for free. We need to conserve and protect it. And climate change, which we are seeing it, and the impacts are very clear. Thank you, Elizabeth. Thank you for that reflection on your past and also on the present day of Moshi. Mm -hmm. We at ICLI are very privileged to actually partner with Moshi and in fact Dar es Salaam um, in moving and mainstreaming nature-based solutions into these cities. And Moshi indeed is an example not only in Africa of where they've used municipal bylaws as a legal instrument to address waste management issues. So standing out as a city, you can be very proud that you come from a town like Moshi, but you have now moved to a city, a global city, Montreal, where, the, where this is your base. And I'd like to ask you, um, in your journey, you've lived in many cities, you've worked in many cities, and you now live in Montreal. What do you feel is the connection today between our growing urban communities and that of nature. And if we can keep this reflection short, I'm gonna come back to you. Um, where are we today, globally speaking, you as a global citizen and a global professional person, what do you feel is the connection in an urban environment between people and nature? Being in Montreal and not just being in Montreal where I've spent so far less than a year, but fortunately, I was educated in Canada, Halifax, Nova Scotia. So I have a bit of knowledge of the uh, urban cities in Canada. First, it's completely different. And what I like being in the cities in Canada, and currently I'm sitting in Calgary, is going to walk to the parks. And I can see the results of being locked down and now slowly the situation, I mean, the, the situation is opening up. It's like we are now fighting to really enjoy the green parks, enjoy the green spaces. And especially being in Canada, we need to enjoy now because very soon we'll be locked in by the weather. So this has been a fascinating uh, thing for me. I mean, in Montreal, going to the Natural Museum, going to the botanic garden, I mean, going to the uh, old port, all these areas is like, I'm in a different world completely. And especially when I compare where I come from and even where I was living just before coming to uh, Montreal and that was in Nairobi, Kenya, where you have a national park in the middle of the city and human wildlife conflict is order of the day in the media every day, where 
The local communities want to protect their farms. The government wants to protect the wildlife and how you bring the two together and live harmoniously and cohab cohabit. So I'm learning a lot being in Montreal. I enjoy, I should say, but at times I'm also worried as developments continue, skyscrapers continue to mushroom, how long will these green spaces remain? I stop there. Thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth. And now on this note, we're focusing in on Montreal. What a wonderful uh, um, and iconic city. I was there once and what a privilege it was. I'm now introducing to you Laurence Lavigne Lalande, a city councillor and executive committee member of the city of Montreal. Laurence, I want to ask you, um, reflect on what Elizabeth is saying about life in, in Montreal today and the connection with nature in terms of your policies, your strategies, your action plans. Where is Montreal in the global space and why is Montreal so focused and such a pioneering city when it comes to mainstreaming nature and biodiversity in your city? Thank you very much uh, for having me today. Um, it was really inspiring your story, Elizabeth. Uh, well, in Montreal, we, I can say that we are lucky because we are an island, so we are surrounded by water, something that a lot of people living here sometimes forget. I think I realized that I was 12 years old, even though I grew up, grew up here. I knew we had great parks. We, have, we had Mont, Mont Royal, which is really a great place to go uh, in the city, but realizing also that nature is not only green space, but it, it is also the link we have with uh, water, with the ocean that is not that far from Montreal. So it's, we are in a context where uh, we are surrounded by, by biodiversity as well. Um, but I think what is really great about Montreal right now is that we um, really, really um, understand that biodiversity is an underestimated asset. We decided that we will um, try to focus on uh, showing uh, people, showing our partners, our, the other cities around, uh, the importance of this asset and what role biodiversity can play in a city of like Montreal. As I said before, we are surrounded by water. Uh, this is a great, uh, uh, this is really great, but it's also have a lot of, um, add a lot of complexity with our territory. And I think we really decided that uh, we will recognize this, the, the asset of biodiversity regarding um, the, the role that plants, uh, trees can play in the city of Montreal, really urban, really dense cities, and that it can help us reduce uh, hot spot, heat waves, it clean airs. We, ha we have a, a big downtown, we have industries here in Montreal, so the, the importance of this canopy in Montreal is really, really uh, great. Um, we have to show to people that it's, it is an asset uh, assets for tourists, of course, but it is also an asset for economic development. It is also an, an asset for the health of people. It can reduce, if we have a great biodiversity, we can reduce um, respiratory disease. We can reduce the cost of health system. Uh, so, and we can use biodiversity to fight against a lot of um, of problem that we face now and that we will face in the future regarding uh, the, with the impact of climate change as well. So I think a few years ago and more and more now, we realize that it is an asset, it is a tool that we have to use, that we have to protect. And of course, we are uh, working really hard with different strategies, different plans, different objectives that we are putting in place to make sure that we protect this biodiversity. But I'm sure uh, I, I will be able to talk a little bit more about those objectives a little later, or I can go right now, but I don't know. Uh, uh, please, I think, I think it's important to hear about um, your current plans, but also, um, yeah, the actions. I mean, we know that last year 
there was a declaration coming from the city uh, about the very, very large urban park, for instance. Yes. Um, and we now saw during um, COVID-19 that a lot of people around the world um, renewed um, their connection with nature in a way that they, for the first time, realized that they cannot access nature during lockdowns, very hard lockdowns. And there seems to have been a global tendency towards people appreciating the access to open spaces and parks and so on. So we would like to hear from you. Um, what are your future priorities? What are your future plans in terms and policies? Uh, in terms of being a leader in the field. Uh, for a very long time, Montreal's been right there next to uh, cities like Curitiba, um, Barcelona, Cape Town, many others um, that, have, that have actually led the way in terms of mainstreaming nature at the urban level. What are your plans and future visions for mainstreaming nature in, in the city of Montreal? Um, well, as you mentioned, we. Um, we uh, announced uh, in two thousand, well, a, one year ago, uh, that we will create the great uh, park of the west part of the island, which will be the great, the, the biggest municipal park in Canada. So we um, we also have in Montreal a lot of wetlands. We know it's really important for biodiversity to protect those, and there was a lot of those uh, wetlands in the West Island. So we decided that we will connect those wetlands with other parks that are there, and we will create a big park. Uh, not only because we think it's important to protect uh, areas, we increase the the objective of protecting areas from six percent to ten percent of the the territory that we want to protect. We also um, increase from 20 percent to 25 percent the canopy index that we want to see here in Montreal. So we are really focusing on those things because we know it's important for biodiversity but also as I mentioned before it has a really big impact on the quality of life of people of Montreal. This park will not be a private park, it's a municipal park. People will be able to go there, to go there with their family too and we want to make sure that those this environment, those parks, those connection to the to the river that we want to do more and more, are there also to play a role of awareness of education. Uh, also, it's not only to protect them, but it's also to explain the importance of those, uh, of the preservation of those uh, place for Montreal for the citizens of Montreal, but also to explain how it is important in a global way. Also. Um, we are working also on um, pol policy for protecting pollinating insects. Uh, we know that there's a lot of difficulty from um, the farmers as well to uh, grow food. We want to make sure that we increase urban agriculture in, here in Montreal. We think that biodiversity is not only uh, protecting a, a park or wetlands, but if we produce more uh, food here in Montreal, it will have a big impact on our greenhouse gas emission from connecting people to fresh food. And for that, we have to, um, to make sure that uh, we have a strong a strategy to make sure that we have pollinizate, pollinizator uh, here in Montreal, that they are still in the territory. We are working also to connect those great parks. We have 16 great parks or nature parks here in Montreal. They are far from each other sometimes and we want to make sure that they are connected one to each other to make sure that the animals, the, the flowers, the, the bees, they can go from one park to another to make sure that they have uh, all the nutrient, uh, all the, the hiding spots that they need to be uh, there, to, be, to stay there here in Montreal. Um, you also mentioned um, the lockdown. Um, here in Montreal, we realized that there is um, there was an increasing population of the Great Park here in Montreal during the lockdown. It the the um, population in those parks increased from uh, one hundred and fifty percent. So in a dense city like Montreal, where there's a lot of people that doesn't have access to a backyard and more people that doesn't have access to a country house, it's really important to make sure that they can access um, nature near their house, that they can. So it was really, really um, 
useful. The parks were really, really useful during the, this period. I think it has a role to play also on anxiety when you live in a, in a city dense like Montreal. And we are really not that, uh, um, I think it's not a, that strong the anxiety of Montreal if we, you, you compare it to other really really big city in Montreal is still quiet as a big city but uh, we need those places to make sure that people can have access to that they can leave their place you know at, during this lockdown working from home with your three children on your shoulder sometimes it's just good to go outside and take a good um, fresh air so this was really something that um, actually it showed us that we were going uh, on the right direction with this great park, with the, the link that we want to do with all those parks. It just showed us that we were going in the right direction. And we also think that those parks and those green space, they have a role to play also in inclusion, social inclusion, uh, in the, 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 the connection with people. We, we know that uh, the, um, the climate crisis will um, make a lot of people moving from their house, moving from their country. We know we already received a lot of uh, immigrants in the past years. So having those space is a really good way to make sure that people are connecting to each other. We also have a lot of com community garden where people can create connection links to, to each other. So I think it's, a re uh, it's an important role that uh, those natural space have. And of course, uh, educational awareness uh, place also. Uh, and I'll finish with, uh, in Montreal, uh, we have something really great, which is a space for life. It's four museum, uh, planetarium, botanical garden, uh, biodome, uh, insectarium. And they are four museum, really, really um, nice with the mission of connecting people, human to nature. Um, but during uh, the lockdown, they were closed, obviously. So we, in a few days, we create a new program and they decided that they will go out in the parks. So all the professionals from those uh, four museums, they went to a borough to another to explain people in the parks, you know that this plant is really important for your health. It's, it has this, it is good for this and that reason. Did you know that you can see this planet tonight if you look there? So we went there in, close to people to explain the, the, important, uh, the importance of nature in a city. So that was really great. We put that in a few uh, days. And it, so we, we can still, we can continue to give this knowledge and discussion with the citizens, even if we were in this lockdown. Well, Laurence, what passion and what leadership shown by you and the city of Montreal. Absolutely. And I think if, if the parties of the CBD uh, are tuned into this, you know, they will all be convinced, they are already convinced of the pivotal role that cities are going to have to play and can play in a post-global biodiversity framework. And Elizabeth, we're going to come to you in a second to tell us a little bit more about the global biodiversity processes underway. But Laurence, as a final question to you, um, why does a city like Montreal feel that it is so important to be active in the international space, connecting cities with each other and learning and sharing through an initiative like Cities with Nature and through the ICLI and other networks that you belong to? Why do you take up that baton and carry it so well? We know the mayor of uh, Montreal, Mayor Valerie, Pro Valerie Plant, is of course the global ambassador for ICLI's local biodiversity actions. Um, why uh, is it important to connect politically, but also technically with cities around the world? For so many reasons, I don't know where to start. Um, well, first of all, I think it's really important that cities um, start to um, to recognize that the society we live here in just has gone too far for some reason in some area and that we have to take a time to rethink how we are building society, how we are building our cities. We have to take a time to uh, think about that. So the first thing is to recognize that there is a problem and that we have to find solutions. So if more and more cities are 
just recognizing this, I think it's going to influence others to just start thinking about, hey, how are we building the cities? How are we doing uh, with uh, our development? So I think this is the first thing we have to do. And if a city like Montreal is doing it, it's going to influence, I think, others. Um, and as I said, we, once we recognize that, we, it also means that we cannot go back and we have to take action. So this is something that we are really uh, doing. But um, it's also because we know that it's not only about preserving one type of tree that we really like, it's also because biodiversity is a tool, as I said, is an asset for uh, so many reasons. You can, if you want to think only on the preservation of different species, Okay, but it also can save you a lot of money in building in green infrastructure instead of uh, other type of infrastructure. It also will make your city more resilient to all the climate change that we, the, the impact of those climate change. Here in Montreal, we have, it's not, we don't live, we don't feel the climate change as strong as other cities in the world, but we still, we are starting to feel it. So we have more flooding, we have more heat waves. So biodiversity is a, has a real and big role to play uh, for, to make sure that we, we will be adapt, we, we will be able, to, we will be resilient, we will adapt to those changes, but also that we will not increase those climate change. So this is absolutely important. And I also think that cities have a lot of tools. We, we can do urban planning and everything. We have a lot of tools to uh, protect our environment, to make sure that we act regarding climate change. But also, we do not have all the tools that we want. And we know that in the next years, more than 60% of the population will live in cities. So if we are all together asking for claiming the power that we need to act, if we are more, we will get more uh, power and we will be able to influence province, states, countries to take their, their, their part of, the, of the sh their sharing part and also put uh, the effort, the energy and the money to make sure that we are all together in this and it, we, we put all the effort together. But right now, I think cities are the one that received the more, uh, that really lived live the, the complication of climate change on a day-to-day -day basis. So this is why it's important for cities to, to raise and, and, and recognize the problem. Thank you. The, the level of government most close to people. And um, Elizabeth, if we can zone out again to the global world um, um, at a global level, there have been some important uh, um, reports and informations coming out over the last weeks and months indeed, but also this week. Um, do you want to tell us a little bit about your insights and reflections about the state of nature and people and planet today? And then let's move on from there to focus on what's happening in terms of the COP15, the very, very important decision-making body that will determine a new global biodiversity framework for us in the future. But first, let's hear about, from your perspective, the state of biodiversity, people, nature, planet today. Unfortunately, the state of biodiversity globally is bad. I'm saying so it is bad and I will come to that. Despite the fact that we all know that biodiversity provides essential services to human beings and basically nature is part of us just as we are part of nature. And Lawrence has underlined that through the work they are doing. Uh, but then just this morning, we launched the latest global biodiversity Outlook report, which took stock of how we are faring in terms of implementing what governments have committed 10 years ago in uh, Nagoya uh, when it adopted or governments adopted 10 year IH biodiversity targets. 
Clearly, biodiversity is declining at unprecedented rates in the history of humankind. This is today. There were 20 Aichi targets, which were governments committed themselves 10 years ago. None of them will be fully met by the end of this year. Not one. Out of the 20, only six will be partially met. Only six. Despite the fact that governments committed to align themselves to the adopted global uh, Aichi biodiversity targets, only 10% of national targets aligned themselves into the global Aichi biodiversity targets. So no wonder we are seeing a progress which more or less goes backward as opposed to forward. Nonetheless, with the partial progress which has been made, if no actions had been taken at all, then the situation would have even been worse than what we are speaking today. So even at that level, I think we, uh, we take heart that actions had been taken and there are some partial progress clearly been seen. For instance, and I might give examples of which are these six areas where there is partial, uh, will partially meet. But even if we look as a scorecard, if you, our kids come from school with a school report and they come with a report of each uh, subject less than 50, I'm sure you will fight with your kid. So if we look at that, then we're even faring bad because even where we are saying partially meet, the highest is 28%. So that is fairly low. So we still have a lot to do. So the six, at least we are seeing uh, deforestation has gone down by at least 30%. So there's some good news there. And therefore the actions going on, we need to upscale to see more to raise the bar. We have clearly also seen where fisheries management have been put in place. The policies, the fisheries are regulated, they are reported. Fishing catch and fisheries management has improved. So again, there we are seeing improvement with regards to fisheries management. Evasive alien species, we see eradication of invasive alien species improved particularly in the islands. So there is progress there. Protected areas. This is where we are seeing a major improvement. Actually, terrestrial has improved from 10% to 15% and marine has improved from 3% to 7%. We are hopefully that come end of December, we would have reached uh, the, the, the SDG target 14.5, which calls for 17% terrestrial and 10% marine. We are already about six, I mean 15%, 16% terrestrial. We are about already 9.1, no, 8.1 marine. So we are really working hard with countries uh, to report their data through the global uh, protected area database to see, and we are really hoping at least this will be one of the uh, SDG target to be, which has the deadline of end of this year to be reached. We have also seen where uh, policies on conservation uh, have been put in place, have improved not just conservation, but has also improved on species extinction. So much as uh, uh, the IPBS report, which is still correct, that we are on of mass extinction of species over a million per year, still species have improved, extinction has improved. Without the ongoing uh, conservation measures, then the situation will have even been critical. 
with regards to countries putting in place policy, I mean, plans, strategies for implementation of the H biodiversity targets where the countries did very well. Over 170 countries already had national biodiversity strategies and action plans, an increase by 85%. So this clearly demonstrates where conservation measures are put in place, improvements can be seen. We have also seen an improvement on international financial flows on biodiversity, in fact doubled. However, not adequate enough to make a difference. So more is still needed there. When we look at uh, elements of the different targets, which are about 60 of them, only seven elements have been achieved of the 60. And of these, 38 elements are only showing some progress. 13 elements do not show progress at all. And in fact, in some cases, even moving away from the progress. And 1% is completely going to the wrong direction. Elizabeth, may I ask you, you're not painting a pretty picture, but this is the reality. This is the reality that man, that, that humankind uh, finds itself in, in 2020, the year of COVID-19 as well. But it's also a year that is preparing us for a very important COP15, the summit which will determine a new uh, biodiversity framework, global biodiversity framework with new targets, new ambitions, renewed commitments. And I'd like to ask you as a concluding question, what do you see the role of local governments and cities um, can play and should play in this new global biodiversity framework? We've heard such inspiring examples from the city of Montreal, such commitment at the local level. So many cities are joining hands through programs like Cities with Nature, committing to make their cities greener, to mainstream nature-based solutions and biodiversity in and around our cities. Do you see perhaps that city by city, connected to each other, we can play a major role and should play a major role in the recovery and restoring humanities to con humanities connect to planet Earth? Perfect. And we are looking at our cities to help us do that. Lawrence has clearly indicated the different measures. We need this to be scaled up globally. And we know environment cross borders. So Montreal cannot do on its own if not the same is not connected with other cities to make the whole country and one country connecting with the other. So the role of cities and national government, I mean, subnational governments becomes critical. Remember, the cities, majority of the citizens in the cities, unlike where I come from, where you separate the cities and the villages, the cities where bigger part of population can afford uh, to enjoy, enjoy uh, many of the given nature uh, greener spaces. But also the city's uh, population needed to be, uh, needed to be uh, enhanced in terms of awareness raising, uh, particularly on the choices they make. Not everybody can afford meat, for instance, uh, in many places. Wild meat, which has been an issue in the recent months, particularly with the COVID. Who can afford that if not for the affluent city dwellers? So the cities plays a major role in terms of creating awareness to the city dwellers to know what nature means, to really understand the contribution of nature into their personal well-being personal and their family well-being on the choices they make in terms of consumption, be it uh, the food, the diets we choose, be it the clothing we wear, where does my cotton come from? Is it from the sustainable uh, farming or not? In terms of waste management, do I play a role in my home waste uh, management or separation? not to, to wait for the uh, city council to come and 
collect everything and go and separate when it is impossible. So many action needs to begin with me and you at individual level. And the city really needs to play that role to create this awareness so that all the actions, all the policies which the subnational governments are putting in place can have a meaning, can be enforced. And we'll find many, it will be very easy for the subnational actually to act because population will be acting on their own. Who wants to be sick? So I'll let take care of what I eat. Is it too much red meat? Is it too much oil? Is it too much junk food? And you see our choices will also dictate the markets, will also dictate what the industry, the business produce from the farms. If we reduce red meat, then we'll have probably the, the livestock husbandry expansion will be reduced. If we use less of timber, then deforestation will also be reduced. Or how do we ensure the timber I use for my building comes from a sustainable forest? So the situated dwellers have a lot to play to help also the subnationals to, do, to play their part. Well, that is such inspiring words and actually very, very true. I think um, us working at the city space, we know that, um, you know, it's really a city is, is like a perfect nexus in itself. It's an ecosystem in itself where most people congregate, where the most important decisions of the world are taken Amen. and where the most influential people are actually coming together. So it could be a wonderful coming together of the private sector, the public sector and civil society, a whole of government, a whole of society approach. And I think that is what you're calling for, given the state of, of biodiversity and nature in the world today. So, Laurence, it seems like the work is cut out for a city like Montreal. You're doing great and you're doing great things. And I think this is recognized by the United Nations. So, Elizabeth, I want to thank you for your leadership, for your vision, for being a woman at the front line of this very, very important topic of nature. Nature, Laurence, you've demonstrated, is so closely connected to climate change and all other SDGs, in fact. And then again, cities. Um, SDG 11 is all about cities, inclusive, safe cities. You focused a lot, Laurence, about the fact that uh, one should embrace the whole of society approach and look at socioeconomic solutions. And Elizabeth, you've echoed that. So um, from our side, these are words that we are also committed to as a city networks, um, together with our partners with New Cities and so many other actors in this field that are embracing nature and that are not saying that urban spaces are deprived of nature and separated from nature. In fact, you have shown tonight or this afternoon for you, this evening for me, that nature is deeply embedded and can be mainstreamed in every aspect of urban life, from urban planning, land use management, uh, behavioral changes with urban community communities as the majority of the population already lives within an urban context and many more will do so and in Africa coming back Elizabeth to where you find your home and I find my home informality is actually growing so also an embracement of the opportunities embedded and in informality. Um, Laurence, I think um, some closing reflections from you just very shortly, a one minute message that you would like to give to this very important for, for, forum this evening. And then Elizabeth to you for a final closing remark. I'm aware we're a few minutes over time, so let's keep it brief. Thank you. Well, First of all, I just want to thank you both for this opportunity. Merci énormément de m'avoir accueilli sur ce panel. Um, well, I, I've said it before, but I think the first thing is we have to recognize. We have to recognize that there is something uh, wrong with the way we do things and that we don't want to go back to normal after this pandemic. We want to go um, further. We want to go different, but we don't want to go back to the way it was. Um, 
and uh, Elizabeth mentioned it a little bit. I think we, uh, as local government, uh, we cannot do it alone, and we have to do it with the citizens. Uh, the city of Montreal uh, have a lot of consultation. We uh, have a lot of uh, public participating um, initiatives. We have um, also a participating budget on ecological transition. So we have to make sure that we uh, use all the force that are here in the city, that are with us, that are there. Is a, there are so many people asking us to do something. We cannot just leave them waiting in their house. We have to put them in action. We have to work with the people. We are stronger uh, together. So I think it's something that we have to do. The connection with the government and the citizens that we represent is really important to make sure that we achieve those objectives. Thank you again for this opportunity today. Thank you, Laurence. And Elizabeth, a closing remark from your side, a message maybe. To our cities. <laughs> yes. One is thank you very much for this opportunity. Uh, but in terms of message, in the cities, we are together, whole of society, whole of government. What is important now, there are many lessons to learn from why we have failed with the H biodiversity targets. There was no time to go into detail. We are also in the process of developing a post-2020 global biodiversity framework, which will replace the IH biodiversity target. So we need to learn the lessons, not to repeat the mistakes of the past, need everybody on the board, because the next framework will not be just for government to implement, but for everybody, universal. And it's not just the environment sector, but everybody at government level, everybody, in the society, be individuals, be families, be uh, national governments, be the business, private sector, even at government level, different government departments. So each, since nature is for us all, it means implementation cannot be left by just one arm of the government. And therefore we are looking forward for political will at the highest level, and the end of this month, we have the UN Biodiversity Summit at the heads of state and government. We hope that this report will enable to underline the message that we are not doing good, a lot needs to be done, and we need that commitment. There is no second planet. We only have one planet. We either make it or we all die with it. Thank you, and thank you very much. Thank you, Elizabeth. And I see Greg is signaling that our session is over. But I want to say that cities are ready. I think Laurence will back me in saying that there's so many cities that appreciate your words, Elizabeth, this, this afternoon today in this platform. And our cities will rise to the occasion and we will do what we need to do. This is coming from all our networks and our combined unity that we feel amongst our cities. Thank you very much for your inspirational words. Although the picture doesn't look good, we can change it city by city, town by That's town, that and national government by national government. Thank you for your leadership. And with this, I'm going to end the session. Thank you very much to both my panelists, and we look forward to chatting again soon. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kobe, as well. Thank you. Thank you all so much. Thank you, ladies, for an extremely bracing and inspiring session uh, that was incredible to hear. Um, well, with that, this session is concluded for the audience members. Uh, we're now going to go to the workshop portion of our program. Uh, one of the things that we hear all the time at New Cities is that during this pandemic, when we are all socially distanced, uh, that there is a real hunger for more interactivity, to share lessons learned, and, uh, and really engage with our peers. And so uh, our next slot in the program here for about the next uh, 75 minutes or so um, is going to be a, whole, uh, a pair of workshops. So I would encourage you both, right, all of you right now, to log out of Zoom when I'm finished uh, and go into our program where you can then click through to join our two workshop formats, which are in a more interactive setting. So the first workshop is Six Connections for the Good Life, which is taking a look at the city of Edmonton, Canada's well-being framework and sort of practical lessons to be learned there. And the second is on technology procurement, the how, what, and why of IT implementation hosted by our friends at Urban Leap. I will only say that if the second one sounds a bit dry, 
technology procurement is actually one of the most important aspects to getting from the top-down smart city vision to something of creating enabling technology that can help cities actually prioritize well-being. So it is an important, albeit dry sounding session. Um, but with that, I would encourage all of you to go again, uh, to go into the program, join one of our two workshops, and we will see you there momentarily. Thank you all again, ladies. Thank you so much.